It's a good day. Good to see you. And I want to tell you a story called the Dora Lake story. And it's a little different, but uh, hopefully it'll be one you will enjoy. At the same time, learning some things about what the book has to say. I want to cover a couple things before I get to the story. Because this is the foundation that you need to know. So turn in your Bible to the book of Acts in chapter 13. The book of Acts in chapter 13. Acts 13 tells us a story a little bit <coughs> where we read some wonderful information. It gives us a picture of the law and grace. After I left Florida Bible College in 1968, I couldn't wait to turn the world upside down. Man, I just knew that everybody out there was just waiting on me. I had four to five hours a day for four years straight of people just pumping the Bible into me. I was memorizing all these verses and they were coming out of my ears. And there was a world out there waiting to see what Yankee was going to do. Well, there's a lot of uh, FBC alumni at that time was kind of chaffing at the bits, hoping that Christ wouldn't come back until we got a chance to do something. Now, we expected the Lord to come at any time, any time. And we were just going to give it what we had. And, uh, well, that was um, 42 years ago. It hasn't shown up yet. But I keep looking for him every day. And I guess the Lord has designed it in such a way that you don't know exactly when he's coming. So you just keep working, believing it might be today. Well, anyway, something wonderful happened back then that I got a chance to see in reality. The power of the gospel and what it did, they kind of set the tone for the rest of, I guess, of my life. Here in the book of Acts in chapter 13, I want you to look at this real quick. I just want to show you some verses that simply says that the law cannot justify a man. The man cannot be justified by keeping the law. Now, you would think, well, everybody knows that. No, they don't. A lot of people don't know that. Now, if you come to church here over the years, you, you know that. But not everybody comes to Calvary Community Church. So he says here in uh, verse 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, talking about Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, and you ought to underline this, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, if a man has to be justified as righteous as God to go to heaven, then keeping the law is not going to make a man justified. He can't be justified by keeping the law because no man can keep the law. But he does say, all that believe are justified from all things. So just by my faith in what Christ did for me, I can be justified just as if I've never sinned. Forgiven for all of my sins. And it was not by keeping of the law. Look at Romans in chapter 3. Just turn to your right to Romans and chapter 3. And you notice there in verse 20, Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. This is on page 1194 in one of the church Bibles. But in verse 20 it says, Therefore, a conclusion of what went before, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Look at here just a moment. Here's God. He's perfect. Us, we're sinful. We have come short of the perfection of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, short of His perfection. So how can a man be just with God? Where God finds no fault in the man. So God says it's not by the works of man. By your good deeds, you will never be just with God. 
justified. Where God can look you eyeball to eyeball and find no fault in you. Now that's when I take some doing. So Christ came into the world, died on the cross, paid for all of our sins, and when we accept Him as our Savior, as the payment for our sins, in God's eyes, all my sins are paid when I trust Him as my Savior. When I believe He did it for me, He puts that death payment He made to my account, and so there's no sin that the Father sees in me. I am justified, just as if I had never sinned. Now, that's why I can go to heaven. I have been justified. I am not seeking to be justified because if I'm seeking it, it means I don't have it yet. And people who are trying to earn their way to heaven, well, they can't say they know they're going because they haven't got there yet. So it depends on their works. But the Bible already told us that you're not saved by your works. You're saved by grace. So if you accept it as a gift, you can have it now and know that you're justified and know that you're going to heaven when you die. So I have been justified by faith, not by the deeds of the law. Look what it says in the last part of verse 20. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's how I know I'm a sinner. When it says, thou shalt not, and I did. So did you. And so we have all come short of the perfection of God. Now look at Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Verse 28. Therefore, we conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That means without keeping the law. Can't get it any better than this. This is what it says. A man can be justified by faith, just by be, be, believing something, trusting. Not by the work. You say, well, yeah, but believing is a work. No, it's not. So how do you know? I knew you were going to ask a question. Look there in verse 5. Verse 5 of chapter 4. Look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So believing on Christ is not a work. So there. Now you know the rest of the story. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. Remember, there's some things the law could not do. Why? The law couldn't save you. God never said the law could save you. In verse 3, he said, For what the law could not do. Couldn't do. In that it was weak through the flesh. It means that the man, me, couldn't keep the law. Nothing wrong with the law, but it can't save me or justify me because I can't keep it. So the law cannot save me. It can only condemn me. So he says that what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not sinful flesh, the likeness of it, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, but not by us. And then it talks about the Holy Spirit. Now take your Bible look in Galatians in chapter 2. Just turn over there to the book of Galatians in chapter 2. If there's anything that's clear in the Bible, it's that a man cannot save himself by the way he lives. Not by the deeds of the law. Not by your works. It's not by joining a church. It's not by promising to be good. Not to be bad anymore. Quitting your sins and all those things will not help if you're a little pinkies one inch closer to the pearly gates. In the book of Galatians in chapter 2, look at verse 16. Awesome verse. Verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Isn't that clear? That God says, no man has ever been, ever will be, and is not ever going to be saved by his works. And yet, we have people that are teaching a man to save by his works. You see, they change it a little bit and just say something simple like this. You have to turn from your sins to be saved. Think. 
Turning from your sin. That means that you have got to stop your sinning in order to be saved. One guy described it this way. If I'm walking this way, I've got to turn from my sin and go this way. That's works for salvation. The Bible doesn't teach that. God does not save a man because he stopped or turned from his sins or even was willing to. Well, are you willing to be made willing? Well, I'm not willing. Well, are you willing to be made willing? You know why most people sin? It's fun. They like it. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. And it just, that dog won't hunt. It just won't get the job done. So, when you tell a man, you must make Christ the Lord and the Master of his life, that means that he must be the Master and I must be the servant. Do I have to serve the master. Do I have to serve Christ to go to heaven? No. A thousand times, no. That's work for salvation. That's trying to keep the law. That's trying to deserve it. If I try to have to quit my sins in order for God to save me, it means that I must deserve to be saved. And if I have to promise God I'm going to live a certain way, then what I'm saying is I've got to deserve to be saved. You don't deserve to be saved. That's why it says, by grace are you saved. Grace means you don't deserve it. And yet they still teach you've got to deserve to be saved. That's not in the Bible. So, this is so good. It is so clear. Look at Galatians in chapter 3. Look at verse 11. Galatians 3, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law of the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. No man. I wonder what that word no means. <laughs> you know, one of these days I think I'll preach a sermon on what does no mean. <laughs> I think I did one day. You probably missed it. Look at verse 21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, very righteousness should have been by the law. In other words, if God had given a law that would save a man, then that's the way it should have been. But God never did. Find it. It's not in the Bible. Everybody must accept Christ as their Savior. Well, there is no salvation. So this is what is taught in the Bible. Now look in Romans chapter 2. Go back to Romans now. Romans in chapter 2. We're going to do this one more time. Just different verses, but those people that are seeking to be justified by the law. Well, what does it say about them? <clears throat> in Romans chapter 2, look at verse 25. Well, you've got, you got to be circumcised to be saved. Keep the law. Verse 25. For circumcision, truly, profited, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. In other words, if you don't keep the law, circumcision does nothing for you. It does not save you. The only reason they had circumcision mentioned in the book of Romans in chapter 4 when they're talking about Abraham, it was the seal of righteousness that they believed by faith. And when they don't believe that way, circumcision had no value to it. Except for the, the man. Of course, we don't talk too much about circumcising a woman. I guess they just can't be saved. <laughs> but the Bible is clear that a man cannot be saved by what he does. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 13. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world, talking about Abraham, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That one day, you and I are going to rule and reign with Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We're the church. God made promises that sent all the way down the line, even to us, that all families of the earth would be blessed because of their faith in the Lord. And because of faith, we're blessed with faithful Abraham. We get what he was told he would get. And that's the righteousness of God put to our account. 
And it was done not by the law, but because God made a promise to Abraham 430 years before the law was ever given. Look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 31. Romans chapter 9 and verse 31. Talking about Israel here. <clears throat> but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. <clears throat> because, in verse 34, verse 32, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, and they stumble at that stumbling stone. Now the stumbling stone is Christ. They stumbled over Him, and the law pointed to Christ. So they rejected Christ, and all they had was the law, and they're trying to save themselves by the law. And so the veil was over their eyes, and they could not see when they read the Old Testament. And as it says, that that veil was still over their eyes until they put Christ in there, and then all of a sudden they can see and understand. But not until then. I, I want to show you this very quickly because it's so good. It's not part of my note, but it's okay. Romans chapter 10. You're right there. Well, look what he says in verse 1. Brethren, he says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that God, that they have a zeal of God, not according to the knowledge. For they've been ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believes. So he says they're ignorant of God's righteousness and they're going about trying to establish their own righteousness. You see, if you knew that God would give you eternal life as a gift, You'd stop working for it. Well, wouldn't you? Why work for something you can't get? It's free. And God says, He doesn't want the righteousness that man's trying to send up. He wants you to accept the righteousness He sent down. Jesus Christ came down, and the reason they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God because they're ignorant of it. They don't see it. They don't understand. So God has done a wonderful thing for us. Uh, look in Galatians in chapter 2 and verse 21. Galatians in chapter 2 and verse 21. Galatians 2 21. This is an awesome verse. Very good verse. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. It means that if a man could save himself by his works, Christ would not have had to die. He died in vain. If a man could save himself by his works. But since no man can save himself by his works, Christ died for every man. If a man could save himself, Christ died for every man except those who couldn't earn it. They didn't say that. It means that no man can earn it. Not even you. Not even me. It doesn't make any difference who it might be. It doesn't make a difference if it's the President of the United States or the Pope or Mother Teresa or Hallelujah. No man can save himself by their good works. All of their good works, all of them, never helped save them. Had nothing to do with them going to heaven. Either they trust Christ as their only hope to get to heaven or they don't go to heaven. That's how simple it is. Well, what happened years ago? Well, I finished out going to the camps, Indian camps in Oklahoma, and then I, I, Arizona, and then Iowa, and then Minnesota, and then uh, I'm in mean, South Dakota. So I got to meet a lot of different Indians from a lot of different tribes. Wind up in Colorado. And in Colorado, I uh, got a job as an assistant pastor. Because I was 26 years old, didn't know much about how to build a church. Uh, Teenagers, I love teenagers. I love to work with the kids in camps and any kids. But all of a sudden I find myself a, a youth pastor. You know, working with some of the adults. And it's easier for you to work with somebody your age and under, but a lot of these were older than me. And there was a guy there that would fly me around to different places so I could speak in different states. 
because they had this Christian Businessmen's <coughs> Association. And so they, like my youth, and I guess I was a little energetic, and they liked the way I talked, because I was from Georgia. And out there, you know, I didn't sound exactly like them. I don't sound exactly like anybody. <laughs> but anyway, the winter time came. And I was asked if I would be the speaker at a hunter's banquet in Walden, Colorado, a place called Brown's Ranch. And so they asked me if I'd come and speak. I said, sure. They said, you only got a half an hour. And I said, that's fine. So I drove a couple hours to get there. Of course, it's a couple hours back. But I'm going to stay up here for two or three days because I'm going to go to this hunter thing. And they're all up there, these hunters, and they're out to shoot elk. I've never seen an elk. I don't even know if I haven't seen a picture of an elk. So while I'm there, they had the banquet. And I was supposed to speak when everybody got to eat. So I had a half an hour and I spoke on how to know you had eternal life. How you can be positive to go to heaven when you die. I even pulled out my wallet and I did this little thing here with my wallet. I said, this is you and me. This is sin. We all have sin on us. God says that he loves us. He hates our sin. And for us to pay for it, it's eternal separation from God. And that you got to be perfect to go to heaven. We're not perfect. And God says you can't earn your way to heaven. And this hand represents Jesus Christ. God in the flesh came into the world because He loved us, hates our sin because it separates us from Him. Christ took the sin, paid for on the cross, came back from the dead and said, if you believe He did it for you, He put that payment He made in your account and you get to go to heaven on what He did for you. And I said, if you believe that, you can know you have eternal life. So I went to heaven and explained it. I gave the invitation. And there were some people that trusted Christ as Savior before five. Not a lot, but four or five of them. So it was all over with, and I'm standing up there, you know, minding my own business like I always do. <laughs> four guys come up to see me. They all had beards. About Mennonites. <laughs> Quakers or something. So they came up to me and they says, um, We enjoyed what you had to say. Thank you. Says, um, We're from. Minnesota, that's called Dora Lake. We have the door. So we want to know if you'd come up there and, and have a revival meeting for our church. I said, sure. I don't know where it's going to be. Sure, I know. Anyway, I talked to them for a little bit, found out that they were hunters that had been up in Montana. They made a vow that they're not, they're not going to shave until they get their elk. <laughs> That's why they had any beards. <laughs> they hadn't got anything yet. So anyway, they said, would you come up in the spring? Because this was in about October. I said, sure, I'll go. Anyway, I thought I'll never hear from them. And lo and behold, I did hear from them. About three months later, they called me up and asked me, do uh, you remember us up here in Minnesota? I said, yes, sir. Would you come up here? I said, yes, I will. So anyway, I asked a the preacher there at the church where I was going. His name was Archie Getter. He was the pastor of the church, and uh, he was now the president of the uh, uh, Rock uh, Bible College that was started by Clifton L. Fowler that led Ray Stanford to the Lord. But anyway, uh, I says, what, what, do, what do they believe? He says, well, he says, uh, they got a pretty good document statement. And it was a Christian and Missionary Alliance church. He says that, uh, that their document statement was pretty good. He said, but you have to find out what the individual church Okay. So anyway, it was the pastor who wanted me to come up there. The other three guys I didn't know, and I just knew that one was a pastor. So it was in March, and I go up here for this meeting. It's winter conditions. I'm driving along, the pastor's going to pick me up, and the, the snow banks are high as the car. And we're walking down the road, and I couldn't see no houses. I couldn't even see roads. So we finally pulled into this little old church. And he said, well, we're there. Oh, boy. I says, where's, where's the people live? He says, they're around. Now, there was no light in this town. I don't think there was a crossroad in this town. Just one road off the main road. And they lived on the side. So that Sunday morning, I got up there and I preached. And I preached on how you can know you have eternal life. I only have one message. I just changed the title. <laughs> I can't 
think of anything better, so I would just hang with what works. Now, since you've heard me, I only got one sermon. I just keep changing the title. That's all it is. It's just the same. I did the same thing if you notice. So we just use just verses to bring out the same thing. And so I preached, and a couple of people trust the Lord. And uh, after the service was over, this year one preacher stood up. And I know it was a preacher at the time. He says, I just want you to know, I disagree with what you're teaching. He said, but you're the guest speaker, and I'm not going to come to the meetings because I don't want to be in any trouble or no conflict. So I just will not come to the meetings. I said, well, thank you. I thought that was a nice man, but I mean to write a prop. He said, I was a false prop. Well, that afternoon, he went and told everybody not to come to the meetings, that I'm a false prophet. Well, they had never heard a false prophet before. <laughs> that night, the church was packed. <laughs> and get this, seven preachers showed up. And they warned their people, and they called them up, don't go, but they came because they wanted to see this false prophet. It's amazing how God can work. And so, I had little questions and answers at the beginning before I was starting my service. So as I opened up the questions and answers, these guys would ask these questions. What about James chapter 2? I said, what about James chapter 2? I mean, I knew where they were going. But I've had enough youth meetings to know that James chapter 2, ah, faith without works is dead. So anyway, I just preached a sermon that while I'm going, you get that message. Anyway, I got uh, I explained James chapter 2, and they would try to quote the verse, and I had, well, I, I just came out of Bible college. I finished the verse for them. It says, somewhere in the Bible talks about blah, blah, blah. I said, you mean blah, 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 I'm trying to be smart. I'm just trying to help them out. And finally, one guy stood up and says, I disagree with what you're preaching these, to these people. And this one lady stood up, and she looked over at them, and she said, well, pastor, blah, blah, blah. I want you to know I went to your church for years. And I had no clue where I was going to go when I died. And I heard this man this morning, and it made more sense to me than anything I've ever heard. More than what I understood under you for 10 years. And I trusted Christ as my Savior. And now I know I'm going to heaven when I die. She says, why don't you sit down and shut up? Why didn't he? I didn't know he was a pastor. And it wasn't long before I found out there's seven of them here, and they all came because they were going to Set me straight. They're going to teach me a lesson. Well, I didn't have enough sense to run. I'm just a 26, 7 year old kid. But I did believe that this book is true. And I believe that salvation is a gift. And they were mad because I was telling the people that you did not have to keep the law to go to heaven. And so, each night, they would just warn everybody not to come to the meetings and all that. People kept coming. And we had people trust the Lord every night. Wednesday night, I was laying on the floor after the service for that night. And we went to Jim Smith's house. And I was laying on the floor, flat on my back. I had such bad back problems back then. Uh, I had heard it when I was in Bible college, and I had to have two braces on my back. And it was so sore, and I could hardly stand up. And I was in Hurtsville. So I laid there. And I was in pain and agony. And the phone rang. And, he, and the guy looked at me and said, Jamie, it's those uh, guys down the road. Uh, they're the ones that wants to tar and feather you and ride you out of town. On the <laughs> now, tar and feather I got, but I didn't know what riding out of town on a rail was. And uh, uh, they were fixing to do me some physical harm. They were furious because, see, their wives had come to the meetings. And then they would go home and tell them what the preacher said. And they said, Yankee says that, that guy named Yankee, it says you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments to go to heaven. And they knew it did. Now they didn't keep them. They couldn't even list them. You know, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not play marbles. Because <laughs> it says in their marble lot. And so they didn't even know what the law was. But they knew you got to keep them. Whatever they were, you got to keep them. And so they decided they're going to deal with me. And uh, 
They said, Jamie, they, 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 they want to they wanna meet with you. And I'm laying there on my back in agony. <laughs> I said, tell them we'll be right over. We'll do it now. I mean, if they're going to do it, do it now and get it over. I can't live it. I mean, just the excitement of what could happen is just <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> so, in fear and tremor, we went to the house. And when we got to their house, this is late on Wednesday night. And when we went in there, I had one friend with me. That was Jim Smith. We went into the house. And it was like a low-hanging cloud in there. Now, I can't stand smoke. I can hardly breathe around smoke. I spent three months in the hospital because I almost died from smoke inhalation. And they're just the smoke in my crazy. But I never say anything like I just let them go through it and let them do it. So I went in. Walked right on in. I thought my friend was right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> but I already walked in. And, and all three, there's three or four guys in there, and they all got in my face. And they started hollering and yelling at me. So what about James chapter 2? What did this say about the Ten Commandments? And you got to keep it. And I'm just, just, just listening. I mean, they're, they're right in my face. These are loggers. These guys were. <laughs> <laughs> You know how I built up my muscles when I was young? I used to feel the bathtub full of water and I'd pull out the plug and then fight the current. <laughs> I had a strap and physique and strap broke. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm in this room and they're in my face and I finally asked, I said, can, 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 can I say something? And they finally stopped long enough and I says, can y'all just be quiet for a minute? Let me say something for 10 minutes. Then you can ask me any question you want. That's when the guy brought me, he looked at me and said, 10 minutes. And then we can sit down on the couch. And that one backed up to that wall, and the other one backed up, and a couple were standing over there on my left. I know I got 10 minutes. That was the fastest 10 minutes of my life. Seems like I started and it was over. <laughs> but in that 10 minutes, I did my dead little best to make the gospel clear as a bell. I even did my little wall of illustration. And then at the end of it, I quoted Ephesians 2 and 9. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Rodney sat on the couch. He looked at me and he says, Can you show me that in the Bible? I said, Yes, I can. He said, Do it. So I got my Bible and I turned to Ephesians 2 and 9 and I stuck it under his nose. And he read it. And then he looked up. He looked at the other guys and he says, fellas, shut up. It's in the book. They didn't know what the Bible said, but whatever the Bible said, they believed it. There's like a lot of Christians. You, know, you believe the Bible, you don't know what it says. But I said, I saw it in the Bible. He says, and he says, explain that to me again. I says, it's just like if I offered you my wallet and you accepted, what would you have? It's a little wallet. If I offered you my watch, you accept what we have, we'll watch. And all of a sudden, Chan, who was standing against the wall, he says, I see it, I see it, I see it. And he ran out of the house. Now, nobody at the time knew what he saw. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like Tad. You don't know if he sees it or not. But he ran out of the room. And so, Rodney trusted Christ as his Savior. We talked a little bit and I explained a few more things to them and two of the other guys did not. They were still burning. So I left that night and I went to the preacher's house and I went to bed. That morning, the preacher knocked on the door and it was early in the morning. I thought, man, it's I thought I'd get a chance to sleep in a little bit. But he says, uh, there's some guys downstairs that want to see you. So I quickly got dressed. <clears throat> I went downstairs. <coughs> they had already been to the woods so they go early in the morning. And they couldn't get out of their mind what had happened that night. And so they came and they wanted me to talk to a guy there by the name of Danny Adams. So there was Rodney, Chan, and Chan's son. Yeah. They had been out in the woods. And they just had to put down their chainsaws and they talked about it and they couldn't stand it, so they came to the house and asked me if I'd talk to them. So the preacher opened up the door and there stood these three guys, Mo, Larry, and Curly. 
and they're standing there looking at him. And Rodney said, we want you to tell him what you told me last night. And Dan was standing there like this. Like, you ain't going to get me. You're not going to get me. And so they all three started to walk into the room. I said, no, no, no. I just want him. So the other two stayed outside, and Dan came in and he sat down on the couch, and he says, you're not going to get me. I said, let me just show you something. I took the Bible, and I simply showed him Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He saw Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and I didn't have to explain too much. But in about 10 or 15 minutes, Dan trusted Christ as Savior, knew he had eternal life, and knew he was going to go to heaven when he died. He was so excited. What had happened to his dad? The one that said, I see it, I see it. He ran out of the house. He went home. He walked into the house and says, Honey, I'm going to heaven when I die. And she says, The blankety blank blank you are. <laughs> and she didn't say blankety blank either. <laughs> he says, No, I'm, I know I'm going to heaven. She says, You do not. You ain't no better than I am. He says, no, but I'm going to heaven. He says, no, you're not. He says, yes, I am. He reached down on the table and picked up a candy bar. He says, here's a candy bar. Take this candy bar. She said, I don't want no candy bar. He said, take the candy bar. She said, I will not. He said, take it. So she found she took the candy He said, that's the way it is. <laughs> understood what he said. She trusted Christ as Savior. Dan came in the house. And they both says, we know we're going to heaven when you die. When we die. And he says, that Colorado preacher might have got you, but he ain't going to get me. And he cursed. And so that's why they had him over there at the house the next morning. It was an unusual story. But it was an awesome story. I saw how powerful the gospel really is. Because you didn't have to sugarcoat it, just hit it straight. And I guess if I had been sweet and kind and all sugary, I probably couldn't have done anything. But it's because I am, to a lot of sense, I'm raw. I'm not a smooth, polished individual. If you think I am, you should have saw me then. <coughs> I had a reckless abandonment to faith. I just believed it and I said it. And if you don't like it, that was tough. That was my attitude. And it was it, it hit hard. But it hit right between the eyes. But I don't know. Maybe that's what those guys need. Now, I try to be as sweet as I can from now on. Ever since then, I've been as sweet as I can. They were going to car and tell me. But they trusted Christ as Savior. And so the whole bunch, about 60 or 70 people trusted Christ as Savior. And they wanted to come into the church. And the older people in the church wouldn't let them. They didn't want them in their church, wouldn't let them become members in their church, and told them to leave. And these older people in the church didn't want anything to do with these new believers. And so they're, they're, it was hurting them. Because this was moms and dads, and aunts and uncles, and their kids. But just a whole bunch of them Trusted Christ as Savior. And the old ones that were in the church kept thinking, you've got to keep the law to be saved. Now the preacher who got me up there, he believed in eternal security. But he didn't want to preach it because he didn't want to make the people mad. So he got me to do it. <laughs> and they got mad. And it wasn't long before some of the guys came over to the preacher's house. And they had been there for 10 years with this preacher. And they left this preacher and his wife and they got him and they pulled him outside of the church and he was fixing to beat him up physically. And Jim Smith and Jim Paget got over there and they stopped him. The preacher wound up leaving and went to take a church in, in Alaska. And I've been there twice to speak for him in Alaska. Thanks for it, Seekins. But see how quickly ugliness can happen. And so the new believers, they just wound up getting them another piece of land and somebody gave them some property and they were loggers so they worked in the wood. They cut down their own trees and built their own buildings. Then they had a camp. 
and they had that going for almost 40 years. I left them that week, and I went down to Reamer, Minnesota, because they asked me if I would come down to Reamer, Minnesota. I've never been to Reamer before, but I went to Reamer. When I got down there, the preacher told me, he says, um, I haven't told anybody you were coming. I said, you want me here for a week of meetings? You never told anybody I was coming? He said, nobody can come anyway. He said, nobody comes to church. He said, we haven't had anybody trust the Lord here in 10 years. I said, why did, why did you have to come? He said, because i got things to do this week, and I'm, in, I'm leaving at the end of the week. I'm moving. I just want you to finish out the Bible, and you want to preach the sermon. I said, will you walk with me to the town? So he said, sure. So we went to town. We went into this here little store, and I bought me some markers and some poster board, paid for it myself. And I put on there, son of a bootlegger, speaking, and I put it all in there. And I said, well, now we're going to go pass them out. He said, where are you going to go? I said, let's go. We walk down the street. Here's this beer joint. <laughs> I walk right into the beer joint. He says, you're going in there? I said, yes, I am. I went to the beer joint. I said, sir, can I put this up on the window? He looked at it, son of a bootlegger. <laughs> yeah, that might be fun. <laughs> so I went, because most of the stores in the town were beer joints. So anyway, I put them up. He said, nobody's going to come. Sunday morning, people came to trust the word. Sunday night, more people came, trust the Lord. Every night, and by Wednesday night, the church was packed. Unpacked. Because people would trust the Lord, and they were telling people, and more came, and more came. Well, they heard about this down in Minneapolis. The head of the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination sent out letters, warning against Ralph, alias Yankee Army. <laughs> he is a false prophet. He's a church leader. And they don't not to let him in churches. So they sent that out. It went to two major denominations. I've only been out of Bible college for one year. <laughs> and I've been blackballed in two major denominations. <laughs> and all I did was explain the gospel. And you talk about, I mean, <laughs> it was unreal. And so, the last night, Friday night, the church was packed. There was no room for anybody to sit down. And three guys walked in in suits. And the preacher's up on the platform. He leaned over and says, see those guys coming in the back? I said, yeah. He says, they're from Minnesota. Those are three big honchos. They come up here to deal with you. They want to meet with you after the service. He says, they said you're a false prophet. But there was no place for them to sit, so they had to go in the nursery and watch through the window. <laughs> so while I'm sitting up there, I thought, I think I'm going to preach another sermon. I told the rest I just changed my sermon. He said, what you going to preach? How to recognize a false prophet. <laughs> I think if I'm going to get accused of it, I might as well tell them how they can recognize one. So by the time I got through, those three guys, they snuck out the back door. <laughs> and never talked to me or said one word to me. Back in Colorado, I knew this thing had been blown up. And in the Evangelical Free Churches of America, they all said about it. Arnold Olson, who was the president of it, took over one of the positions that uh, Billy Graham had at one time. And here they had this big meeting they had to have in seven different states all come together and they're going to have a trial. I'm, I'm going to be on trial <laughs> to see whether or not am I a a false prophet or not. And so when they get ready for their meeting and I'm getting ready to walk into the room, this one little smart aleck preacher comes up to me and kind of, you know, Chris is like, oh, I didn't kind of specify a little bit. He said, you know, we're uh, going to sit in judgment on you today. We're going to find out where you stand. I said, I already know where I stand. We're going to find out where you stand. And they had to listen to all of my sermons that I had preached up there. They had copies of them. So all of them had to listen to all of my sermons that I had preached. <laughs> Salvation, the long grace, predestination, you name it, but I did it. Mm -hmm. And now here's these people from this place that have to listen. So they wrote a letter. We find nothing wrong with this man's preaching. There's nothing wrong with what he's teaching. It is doctrinally correct. 
and that Arnold Olson, the head of the nomination, not to change his letter and, uh, and apologize. But he wouldn't do it. He said, when he stops splitting churches, I'll, I'll do it, but never did. And that was 41 years ago. 41 years ago. And I have seen so many that have come out and have preached the gospel because of it. And there's people that have been affected because of that little place up there in Dora Lake where a lot of kids and adults that trust Christ as Savior. Some of those kids that came in going to Bible college, you know, find a former Bible college. Dan Adams, the one that I let you know, he was 25 years old. He went up taking his wife and five kids to Florida Bible College. I only got there for one year, went back up there and pastored the church until he died a few years ago. Rodney Goble, I was up there last year when I did his funeral. He's in heaven. Chan, he died about 10 years ago. But they're, they're, they're gone now. I'm just thankful that I got there when I did. And all that happened, it's such a wonderful thing to know. I get to have those three guys will be waiting on me there. Chan, Dan, and Rodney Goble. And it, it was all started because of just, you know, giving the gospel and telling them that you don't have to keep the law to be saved. There's power in the gospel. You don't know the ramifications and how many people are going to be affected because you made the gospel clear and simple to somebody. They may trust Christ as Savior and then they tell somebody and they tell somebody and they say, no, families have been reached. You're affecting people. Give it a chance. Don't compromise it. Hit it and hit it hard. In love. If you're here this morning you never trusted Christ as your Savior, what do you have to do? Take this candy bar. <laughs> you take it. You can. Christ died on the cross, paid for all of your sins. If you believe He did it for you, you put that payment to your account. You go to heaven on what He did for you. You don't earn it, don't work for it, and you can't buy it. Best news in all the world. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed, no one around. If you're here this morning and you never trusted Christ as your Savior, who would you trust Him right now? You can't save yourself. We're not good enough. We never will be. But it's a gift. It's free. And if you will trust Jesus Christ right now as your Savior, God said He would give you right now as a free gift, eternal life. And I like to know it. And I like to have prayer. So we hit by nice clothes, no one looking around. I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I'm going to ask you just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand just lets me know that you've trusted Christ as your Savior here this morning. And I like to have prayer for you. Anyone else before we close? Say, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior. And preach, I'd like you to pray for me. Would you slip it up real quick? Put it right back down. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just say, yes, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Christ died to pay for my sins. And I'm going to trust Him to take me to heaven. Anyone else before we close? If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you're God's child. You have within you the most powerful message in all the world. Give it a chance. Let people know. Father, thank you so much for this time together. You've been good to us. And we know that as we get closer to getting to heaven, we can see how you've worked in our lives and all the doors you've opened up. And we thank you for it. The context that's been made. Bless each one here.